Welcome to the Senior Defense Logistics Panel. I'm pleased to have this exceptional panel of senior defense logisticians uh, led by Lieutenant General Retired James Vetri, U.S. Air Force, Rear Admiral Larry Jackson, United States Navy Retired, and moderated by George Topic of the Center for Joint and Strategic Logistics at the National Defense University. I think you'll find this a fascinating and most informative panel. Uh, my name is George Topic, and I have um, been asked to be the moderator for the um, logistics panel associated with Star Tides, and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. And I especially appreciate the support of um, Dr. Wells, but um, Lieutenant General retired Jim Vetri, AKA Vetch, and, and uh, Rear Admiral retired Larry Jackson. And we're going to spend a um, little time talking about um, logistics. So we have a few sort of strategic questions. Um, but first, we'd like to start with a couple of comments from each of our um, panel participants. Uh, let me go ahead and start by introducing um, my friend um, Vetch, aka Lieutenant General Vetri, um, who has served the Air Force over 32 years, 3,000 plus hours as a mobility pilot, a University of Maryland graduate, um, but relevant to this discussion, in 2014, he was assigned as the J-4, the U.S. Africa Command, um, did a, such a good job as the J-4 at U.S. Africa Command that they um, subsequently promoted him to Lieutenant General and sent him back to Af U.S. Africa Command to be the Deputy Commander. He's just retired to the Florida Panhandle where he is focusing on volunteer service um, and hurricane relief. And I'm um, sorry about this, Vetch. Um, to all who know him, he is nothing short of a national treasure. With that, Vetch, I will turn it over to you. Hey, George, thanks very much. And uh, Dr. Wells, thanks for organizing and hosting this event and the opportunity to talk about logistics. It, it brings me back to good old days, as you mentioned, George, back in 2014 when I arrived at uh, U.S. Africa Command as the director for logistics. And I want, I want to emphasize that point four. Uh, because prior to me getting there, it was director of logistics. And in my view, of is a passive word. So I wanted to change it for because logistics is anything but passive, it's active. So I changed the duty title to director for logistics. So just something to think about as we kind of talk through logistics and the challenges that we face, not only in today's environment, but going forward into the future. So if I could reel the clock back just a little bit to 2014, when I arrived at US Africa Command, um, that was in the height of what you might re remember as the Ebola crisis in West Africa. And there were three countries, particularly Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone that had just ravaging numbers of deaths with Ebola. So the international community decided to respond. So here I showed up fresh from a year deployment in Afghanistan and found myself to be the director for logistics at US Africa Command. Now I am not a logistician by trade. I'm a mobility pilot by trade. In fact, I was the fourth mobility pilot to be the director for logistics at US Africa Command. So what that should tell everybody is that logistics is not rocket science. And if a mobility pilot can figure this stuff out, just about anybody can. Uh, but there was actually a good reason for that because if you look at the continent of Africa and just the vast uh, space that's there, three and a half times the size of the continental United States, lots of infrastructure challenges, tremendous diversity on the continent. Uh, a lot of the work from a logistics standpoint is actually done through air mobility and through airlift uh, because ground movement becomes such a challenge. But as I arrived and took on this Ebola crisis, what I learned first of all, in addition to the fact that logistics isn't rocket science, is the fact that we have a tremendous enterprise that does joint logistics. So as this crisis was kicking off and I found myself at center stage because it was predominantly a logistics mission, I was getting calls from the Secretary of Defense, Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, from the joint staff, uh, from the director of uh, the, the director of logistics. Um, all kinds of folks across the enterprise were calling and asking what they could do to help and how we could bring the entire crisis is the Department of Defense was not in the lead. We were supporting the lead federal agency, which in this case was USAID, uh, which is not a which is not a significant uh, significant point. 
But it does show that the military can either be in the lead or they can be a supporting agency. So I had a few picture and set the baseline for me for what logistics were all about. And sometimes I think we'd make logistics a little bit too hard. And I try to keep things as simple as I can. So when I look at logistics, and you've probably heard this phrase before, getting the right stuff to the right place at the right time. And that was really what we were up against uh, as we faced the Ebola crisis. The good news was, for whatever reason, we were able to turn the tide. And I think even to this day, uh, we're not sure what exactly turned the tide. But I do think that the response that was provided by the entire international community to those three countries specifically made a huge difference. And that was uh, built with a cornerstone of logistics at the end. So fast forward, as George mentioned, I did two years as director for logistics, came back to the Pentagon for just about a year and then came back to US AFRICOM as the deputy commander. And I wanna kind of bookend the other end of this with the current COVID crisis, because this was really the first time that the entire continent faced a crisis at the same time. And again, for whatever reason, if you look at the impact that COVID has had on the continent of Africa, it has been much less than we had originally thought when projections were starting off and we thought um, this thing could really take hold and create a catastrophic effect. We have not seen that to date uh, and we're hopeful that that will continue. But the same thing, logistics was at the absolute center of this uh, crisis as we went forward. Things from getting personal protective equipment to the right place, uh, getting blood supplies, getting testing equipment, getting all that stuff in place, evacuating patients. Very early on in the crisis, we had a contractor that we had to evacuate back to Germany. And what we found was that our current system was not set up to carry COVID patients. So U.S. Transportation Command jumped in uh, with both feet, made some tremendous efforts and got us the capability to be able to move patients in a COVID environment. So those are just a couple of bookends from the Ebola crisis to COVID that really kind of paint the landscape, if you will, of the five years that I was involved with logistics, uh, particularly at U.S. Africa Command. With that, uh, I'll go ahead and shut up, George, and let's uh, turn it back to you. Over. There we go. I've mastered the mute button here. So, okay, thanks, Vetch. I want, I'm hope we're going to come. I'd like to come back to talking about um, the you know the enterprise aspects of both Ebola and COVID. And you know, and if people don't hear the echoes of Ebola um, in COVID, you know, something is really really wrong. Um, and you know, it really sort of makes you think about you know some of the things we ought to be paying attention to going forward. And as we think about um, other other things that could that we will be involved in in the years ahead. So let me go ahead and shift on to, um, now you talked about logistics as not being rocket science. Um, and I'm going to um, ask um, Admiral Jackson. Um, and so he has to demonstrate the shameful thing, but we'll do our best here. So um, let me introduce Andre Admiral Larry Jackson, as I said, a surface warfare officer. Um, he is a University of Virginia graduate and an English major to boot. And so we will in the chat room have, um, we will have definitions for select words that he may use. Um, he has 33 years um, of commission service, um, three, um, three assignments that are of particular note associated with what we're doing here while he was on active duty. Um, and one is the deputy commander of military sealift command, um, um, the um, director for plans and logistics at United States Transportation Command and Deputy Director for Strategic Initiatives um, on the Joint Staff, specifically in Joint Staff J5. He is currently the um, Director of the Center for Joint and Strategic Logistics, where he is saddled with the challenge of being my boss. And so with that, Larry, I'd like to turn it over to you. Um, hopefully you're going to talk a little bit about some of the deep future stuff we've been working on and some of the potential that we see out in the future. Over. Well, you know, I'll, I'll start off by saying, Vetch, welcome back uh, to the United States. It's great to great to see you uh, again. Uh, I, I recall uh, quite well during my time at. Uh, well, I remember the COVID, or the uh, the Ebola crisis from a slightly different viewpoint that you had because I was at at uh, Military Sea Lift Command at the time. Um, but uh, but I remember quite well you uh, you strong arming me into uh, uh, developing a uh, an, an Africa logistics network while I was at Transcom, and we were both being forced together. So uh, uh, and 
and and I think you know you you perhaps sell yourself short because I think of my so the army the army divides uh, I don't know why they do this but they they have quartermasters loggies in other words uh, but they also have transporters right uh, and I just think of ourselves in the navy and the air force we don't really break them out that way but I just think of ourselves as the transportation kind of side of of things um, but um, but you know I the 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 crises that you talked about, uh, both COVID and, and Ebola, um, you know, other other humanitarian crises uh, that that we've participated in. Uh, I was uh, I was part of Military Sea Lift Command when the uh, earthquake hit Haiti in 2010. Uh, star tides played a role there, um, and um, uh, the you know we're we're going to continue to face uh, these kinds of challenges as uh, our our environment changes uh, and um, we move forward in in a world uh, that is um, you know environmentally changing at a fairly rapid pace um, and and having said something that is perhaps mildly controversial I should at this point probably issue a disclaimer and say that everything I say is going to be you know Larry Jackson's opinion and uh, not not the official position of the Department of Defense um, so um, but uh, but as we look uh, to a, a contested future uh, whether we're being contested by a virus uh, or we're being contested by uh, a, a an adversary of, of a pure nature, then uh, we are going to absolutely have to find um, better ways of bringing our logistics capabilities to bear uh, than we have uh, been doing, I think, uh, recently. The truth of the matter is we've played an excellent pickup game. Um, Vetch, what you said, you know, about the way we responded uh, in Africa, uh, you know, we figured it out. Uh, and, and we're not entirely sure what we did, but we do know that it worked. Um, and um, uh, we're going to be facing more challenges like that in the future, but we're going to have less time to figure it out. And it is absolutely critical that the, uh, the planners of the world uh, and the operators of the world begin uh, hanging out with the logisticians of the world on a fairly regular basis because uh, the nexus of those, uh, well, the nexus of planning and, and logistics is what is going to enable operations. And we're gonna to have to find a way to do that very fast and in a highly contested environment. And as we look at the logistics enterprise across the Department of Defense, we see uh, a great uh, potential and, and an absolutely fantastic ability to get things where they need to be under challenging uh, situations. Um, but things are going to get more challenging and we're going to have to be more coordinated and we're, and we're going to have to be more adept at doing it uh, than we have been heretofore. Um, George, is that enough foreshadowing or? Uh... Well, you know, the, I, I think that it's, um, there, there's, that's a, that's a good start, um, but once again, you're not gonna get off the hook with that. Um, so, because uh, I would like you to talk um, a little bit about, you know, about, you know, we, Thomas Friedman, Talked about um, talked about acceleration, and I was going to bring that up as part of my comments, but I'm not. I'm going to let you start with, you know, that um, you talked about how much faster we have to be able to plan, and how much more quickly we've got to be able to execute operations. And you know, if you talk just a little bit about some of the capabilities that you see coming down the road that may may in fact enable us to do this, because aren't we going to sort of get to the point where it, you know, it's going to, stuff is going to move too fast or it's going to be too complex for us to be able to do this over. Yes. I, I, and in fact, I, I would submit that we're basically there. Um, and fortunately, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, the, the, the innovators over in Silicon Valley have been uh, developing uh, artificial intelligence for some time. And, um, and, and it has some pretty amazing capabilities to, uh, to be able to help us uh, in, in, uh, in our, our role as logisticians. But we also have to figure out how to get it implemented uh, inside the Department of Defense in a, in a rapid uh, way, which is, uh, you know, with, with the bureaucracy, just a, a, a bit of a challenge. Um, but um, the, the great news is that we have begun within within uh, the Department of Defense writ large. There's the Joint uh, Artif the 
the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, which is uh, looking to apply artificial intelligence in a variety of, uh, of, of um, uh, applications across the department. But within the logistics community, we've been running a pilot on ourselves, uh, looking at the benefits that artificial intelligence can bring uh, to, to the planners uh, and to the loggies uh, simultaneously. And the benefits are, are truly revolutionary. I, I think uh, we're just beginning to see uh, how important it is to understand not only our data within the Department of Defense, but also the data of companies uh, around the world uh, who may be moving commodities that we might need uh, in relatively short notice. I, I, I think of uh, you know, then Major General Vetri uh, over in Africa, who probably would have loved to have known uh, you know, where some of those supplies that he needed to get into Africa were in the commercial market so that we could have contracted for them you know, on the fly and moved them straight in rather than trying to tap into um, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the defense department or other aspects of the government to try and get those, uh, those supplies there. As we look at a future with a, with a contested, uh, you know, in a contested world, and we look, for example, at, at petroleum, which we're going to absolutely have to have, uh, to be able to compete. The good news is that, um, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of petroleum out there already and, and it's moving around every day. It's just, it's in commercial, uh, it's in the commercial sector and it's very hard for us to understand what is where. Uh, but artificial intelligence enables us to have insight as to uh, what uh, is moving, uh, where it is moving to, uh, and whether we might, uh, you know, what, the, what the, the, uh, the odds are that we might be able to get our hands on. Um, as we look to the future, we're going to have to do that for uh, virtually every uh, logistics commodity that the DOD moves. Um, and I think that, and, and, and we're also gonna have to plan much more rapidly uh, and as much of uh, that as we can automate uh, through AI, uh, the, the more agile we will be and the more uh, adept we will be uh, in our ability to respond to, uh, to to absolutely, um, uh, you know, massive changes uh, that will be taking place at, at incredible speeds um, around the globe uh, if we find ourselves in a, in a hot fight. Um, and with that, uh, George, uh, I, think, I think I have uh, exceeded my, uh, my ability to talk any further on that topic for right okay. now. Okay, well, as it turns out, I can pile on just a touch on that because the other aspect of artificial intelligence, um, and I, I use that term in the in the broadest sense, you know, is the idea the, of making connections that are not altogether you know ob obvious to us and being able to look at things that we just simply wouldn't consider, um, but you know, a machine will sit there and just keep sorting stuff and saying, "Hey, did you think about this?" Uh, and and allowing us to look at these kinds of things. And this is particularly important, not just as we're planning an operation but, or, or some sort of initiative, but as it is in progress, you know, when things change, not only do things change quicker than we can possibly keep up with, but they change in ways that we may not necessarily be able to see um, or, you know, even conceive of in some cases. Um, I'm reminded of, um, you know, General Clark back in um, back in the days of um, de back in the days of the Balkan conflicts, um, and his um, and there was some sort of relation um, between the price and availability of um, women's lingerie um, in in the Balkans and the probability of, of armed conflict, and um, you know, and, and you know, we're just not going to think like that, and. Um, Are you sure you're not making that up? <laughs> I guarantee you I'm not making that up. Um, but, but my point is, and, and we have some very interesting... Is this a case of correlation is not causality, however? Um, we, we hope not. Um, so um, at any rate, though, so, but let me, um, so that, you know, that aspect of artificial intelligence um, and the agility that it engenders, I think is also, is a, is a critical part of this. Um, Vetch, if I can just move back, though, because as we're talking about this part of it, 
you know, Larry um, used the term talking about how to use this stuff, um, how to use, you know, emerging capabilities in the contact uh, within DOD. Um, and, you know, and you know is be better than probably anybody um, about a, an AOR where if you say, hey, what are we going to be, what are we going to be able to do with those DOD resources? And given our priority um, and given the availability of stuff and given the, um, not just the distances, but all the other challenges involved, um, I don't think we can get there from here. And so if you have any thoughts on um, creative or way that you would like people to think about this in the future, um, be interested in your comments. Yeah, George, thanks very much. And, and Larry, thanks for kind of teeing up that discussion. Cause you know, when it comes to the African continent, uh, it's just a unique and different place to operate. And for those of you who have experience in Africa, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't, uh, it's just a, a unique environment. So one of the things uh, that we work really hard on is partnering uh, with our allies and with our partners on the continent, whether that's our 53 African partners from the 53 continents that made up the AFRICOM AOR uh, to the international community that helps support efforts in the African AOR, or even our interagency partners that we work with alongside of DOD. Um, so the, the challenge is moving at a speed and pace that everybody's able to keep up with. And that becomes a significant challenge in the continent of Africa because of the uniqueness and the diversity that's down there. Uh, some countries, uh, when you look at uh, countries like Morocco, Tunisia, very advanced, very capable of partnering with us at a very strategic level and being able to operate. Uh, but then there's many countries down there that aren't even close uh, to the capacity of being able to have this, not only the strategic vision that we have, but just the day-to-day -day capability of being able to come alongside us and do logistics in a partnership uh, approach as we go forward. Uh, Larry mentioned the, the West African Logistics Network, so I'll, I'll use that as an example. So one of the things that we recognized in the Ebola crisis was that we in the Department of Defense had established a relatively good logistics network in the east part of Africa. We had Djibouti that served as a hub. We had locations that we were maneuvering in and out of in, say, Kenya, South Africa, and the like. But in the west, what we found with the Ebola crisis is we had not thought about that, and we had not developed a network. So one of the key lessons learned out of that uh, crisis was to be able to develop a network that we could use in the West for a crisis like Ebola or just day-to-day -day operations as we look to engage on the continent and, uh, and support our partners there. So we worked very closely, as Larry mentioned, with Transcom, a, a COCOM. We also worked with our international partners who also operate in the same region, but most importantly, working with the countries that would make up this West African logistics network to determine where the hub would be, where the spokes would be, how we would operate in there. And then of course, working with the Department of State, the ambassador in those countries that we had to get permissions from the countries to be able to operate in uh, became a very unique opportunity, I think for us. Uh, the good news, Larry, is, is the West African Logistics Network is alive and well. It is established, it is up and running as of, uh, as of the 1st of March um, last year. So it has become a thing, but that only happened because we were able to partner uh, from the ground up and work with our uh, African partners and our allies to be able to bring that to fruition. And I want to touch on another point that Larry made that I think is extremely important. He talked about the importance of the logistician and the planner being together. Now, for those of you who don't have military experience, the logistician, as George mentioned up front, is typically the J-4. Um, the, str the strategic directorate is typically the J-5, strategy and planning. But then you also have this thing called the J3, the operations directorate. So you can plan all this great stuff in the five, but you actually have to make it happen in real world in the three. So I looked at myself three, four, five as kind of the glue that held the five and the three together. So I would always talk about with my fellow directors is I want to have my right arm lock and step with the J3. And I want to have my left arm lockstep with the J5 and I as the J4 needed to be the glue that really connected those two that so that a strategy could actually become an operation, but only through the glue of logistics that brought all that together. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, George, but I had to get that three, four, five thing out there because it's important <laughs> for everybody to know that when we think about these numbers, they really mean something and it's important how they line up. Back to you. 
Uh, no, um, absolutely. Um, Lynn, you've been noticeably silent here. Um, and so I, I was going to offer you the opportunity to pile on on, on any of the aforementioned, but I, and then I was gonna take a couple of minutes and sort of talk, um, talk through unity of effort and um, some, of do, um, some of Mr. Friedman's comments from earlier. No, that was actually, I'm glad you're raising that because the, the whole issue of how we get the unity of effort when there's no unity of command. I mean, the military, we love unity of command and in these types of situations, you almost never have it. And so uh, how do we work, not just among ourselves, but how do we work with people with often very different um, mindsets and capabilities and uh, and uh, uh, histories and things like that to to achieve whatever the agreed outcome is and i think um uh, there's an interesting thing in the panel this morning that talked about the importance of inclusiveness and that we really need to bring in people with quite different views uh, i remember somebody telling me at one point uh, you know, to address the problems we're facing today i need more people with mohawks than buzz cuts and uh, so how do we <laughs> get in there, sir? Anyway, so uh, let me toss that in the mix, please. <laughs> so, OK, um, you know, it, it's um, you know, it, it's um, interesting. Um, I uh, recently um, talked to um, you know, Dave Barno and Nora Bensahel, who just published a book um, about um, adaptation under fire. And one of the lessons that they uh, that they have come away with that they feel is pretty novel and that is, you know, and, and you hear about it from time to time, but, you know, when you talk about the buzz cut business um, um, or, or going to DEF CON or Burning Man, things like this, um, what, what they were talking, one of the things that they talked about in military organizations in particular is that we have a bunch of, excuse me, older people talking to older people um, about things and there aren't any young people who might see it a little bit differently or might have a different point of view. And some of whom are quite smart, or the, many of whom are quite smart, but also many of whom are, are quite well-versed, well-educated, and might be able to see stuff that we don't. And you know, from that standpoint, you know, the idea of inclusiveness, I think, has a particular resonance. And you know, I'm, I'm just thinking through how this works. You know, I, I think about all the interns that we have um, you're going through the Pentagon, and and are we getting best um, are we getting best value out of them? Are we using them? Um, I remember back some years when Dr. Wells used to stop and grill all of his interns after an event and say, "Okay, what did you guys learn here?" and and you wouldn't let them go until they until they answered, and they knew you were going to ask this question. One of those, of course, was my daughter. Um, I also think back to. Um, Lieutenant General Allardyce saying the best thing, the best preparation he had, he thought, for being a Lieutenant General was when he was a captain as an intern in the Pentagon. And, you know, and, and the stuff he learned and saw, but in some cases he said, hey, I was able to really make a difference and able to work on things um, that you know, a few captains got a chance to do. So I, I think that's a really good, um, I think that's a really good point and a really good um, thing to, to consider as we as we go along. Larry, you, you've got your mic off. Oh, oh okay. No, you uh, got it on, so please speak up. Well, no, I, I can't. Oh, Lynn, were you going to say something? Nope. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, I, well, I wanted to, I actually kind of want to pitch a ball down your sort of wheelhouse. Uh, and, and that's to talk about the, the challenges we have with you know the this this way of doing business that us older people seem to have created this this bureaucracy and and how uh, do we how do we allow innovation to take place uh, within the bureaucracy? Um, one of the things that we found in in running our pilot uh, on uh, the artificial intelligence pilot was we just kept running into um, uh, a, 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 just a, a I, it's almost like a castle, it's a bunch of different castles, uh, you know, walls within walls within walls when we try to access data. Um, and this, this, uh, this so, and, and what, what basically would happen is, you know, you might get a, a very senior leader who says, bring, you know, break down all of the walls. Uh, but, but when you get down to the person who, you know, built that wall in the first place, they say, well, look, it's my, my, my job is on the line. Uh, to, to 
you know, verify that these data uh, remain, you know, un, un uh, corrupted, I guess, uh, and and for most and for the most part unused, uh, and um, you know, and and you have to fill out these thirty seven forms in triplicate if you're going to be able to access my data. And oh, by the way, we're going to have to bring the lawyers in, and we're going to have to bring the IT people in, and and the data security people. And it it's just it is it's a morass, and and I think we need to knock down those walls. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that, sir. So for me, one of the better examples was there was a um, there was a maritime domain awareness project uh, some years ago, and uh, what they did is they they linked together the Navy operational data, the um, Coast Guard operational data from captains of the ports and things like that, and the um, uh, and the intel information, and the secret was that everyone retained control over their own data. They would release the data into a common shared file, but there was no, you didn't have to turn over the data per se. So, I mean, that's, that's one, it worked really pretty well. And that's one way to do it. The other thing is um, with some of the languages that are out there, like um, a humanitarian markup language and things like that, like XML, HTML instead of XML and things like that, you have better ways to pull in together data from pretty disparate sources. And I'm involved in one group now, the gist of it is that um, a community should be able to profit from community data. So in a community, you generate all this stuff, everything from wastewater treatment to parking meters to uh, tax records to whatever, but rarely is it ever correlated in ways that uh, benefit the community. And so first of all, the idea is to do that. But then the other part of it and the financial part of it, it goes to um, insurance companies. And the idea is how can you increase the ROI by getting a picture of what's going on in the community about some vulnerabilities that may be shared from this data that people don't even realize that you can say, hey, you know, if you fixed A, B, and C, then we could give you a 7% lower rate on your flood insurance or something like that. Uh, and so that's the interesting initiative of trying to pull together heretofore um, your data that heretofore have only been collected by you know Facebook and YouTube and people like that, uh, and correlated in ways to feed back usefully to the community, but then also turn it to the um, uh, insurance and reinsurance companies to see if they can produce a useful funding stream out of it. So, so hey, Vetch, I'm going to give you a heads up on because um, I'm going to be interested in talking to you um, about um, bureaucracy, but I do have um, um, one sort of ironic. Um, um, addendum to the story that Larry is talking about here. Um, and in the, in the example that Larry is referring to um, without any details, um, one of the people in, or one of the organizations involved in, in what we're discussing, you know, and after we've had all these firewalls and all these, you know, um, impediments to being able to share dat data, um, the commercial organization said, you know, we really appreciate all your hard work on getting these permissions and filling out all these forms. But you don't realize that all this, all this stuff is just out there on the internet. We can see every contract and consequently, we don't really need any of your data. And oh, by the way, the data that we have, because we're looking at real time observations is a lot more accurate than the data that you guys are trying to hide or protect. And um, there's a there's a sort of sad irony to that, and um, but also you know one of those things that we need to think about for the future. So Vetch, if I can um, shift you know because um, you know Larry has um, become a bureaucratic warrior, you know um, going up windmill after windmill, um, you know as you you know but I'd be interested you know you've had a lot of practice with bureaucracy and you've also been you know out as the deputy commander out in the wilderness um, wrestling with a pretty intransigent um, bureaucracy. And so, you know, what I was sort of interested in was from a king for a day perspective, and this doesn't need to be a logistics answer so much as a, you know, you know what should we tell people? What should we te be teaching young people? You know, what, what should be that cosmic message that Sam Barrett, the, the new director um, of logistics on the joint staff ought to be speaking, you know, 
with passion about saying we got to get after this. Over. Well, George, I don't know. I don't know that it's a cosmic message. I think it's actually pretty simple. But we've got to break the bureaucracy down. It, it's getting in our way and it's making things too complicated. And we're going to have to move at such a speed in the future that we can't cannot be hampered by the bureaucracy that currently exists. And I'll give you a perfect example. In, in the current COVID crisis, um, there were there are still uh, partners in need around the globe, and we were not able to move at the speed of need to get the partners what they needed to be able to control the COVID crisis in many areas. Uh, just an example is Italy, not even in the AFRICOM AOR, but I lived in it in Germany. Um, Italy was really ground zero for where people were, were really um, hit the hardest with the COVID crisis, at least early on in the early days, and people were dying left and right. I remember looking at the statistics every day because we had two components um, that are in Italy, our army component, and our Navy component. So we would get the reports and it was just a staggering number of deaths that the Italians were losing. And we, by the time we ended up getting supplies to them, um, it was pretty much uh, late to need and after the fact. Now I'm not certainly not gonna speak for my European uh, command partners because that's their AOR, but that's just something that I witnessed and observed. So I think we really need to empower this young generation uh, to the point that we were talking about earlier uh, the, the good news is this generation that's coming up today has some fantastic ideas. They love technology. They leverage it. They use it every day in ways that everybody that I'm looking at on the screen can't even fathom or imagine. So we need to really unleash that power and that energy and allow them to do some great work. Just an example, you know, if you look at uh, at space as an example for logistics, um, the other day I, was, I happened to be down in Orlando. Uh, when SpaceX was conducting a launch. And I got to look at it from my brother-in-law's back porch and just watch in a matter of seconds how fast we were able to get something from the ground into space. Now imagine, based on the technology that we have today, now we can take those rocket boosters and we can recover them right back on a platform in the middle of the sea. Could we leverage that for logistics? How do we, how do, we do that to get supplies somewhere where they're needed extremely quickly and at a cost that's manageable based on technology and the advancements that it's making. The younger generation is what will make that happen if we allow them to do it. And if we get rid of some of the bureaucracy that's really tying their hands, and not enabling them to be able to take those types of capabilities and kind of thoughts forward. Personal view from Jim Vetri, again, not the Department of Defense. I no longer work for the Department of Defense, but that's my thoughts going forward. Over. Okay. Um. Lynn, were you? Well, so, uh, space is really a good example. I mean, um, uh, what are some other emergent things? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, actually, the two questions here. One is, the, one is the cybersecurity of logistics. Uh, because I was about to go to autonomous vehicles and uh, more and more, uh, you know, uh, remote tagging and uh, in transit visibility and things like that. And, Somewhere along <clears throat> the trade-off between uh, you know, knowing where things are and being able to respond to all this stuff and the fact that uh, uh, we're building this entire society built on the Internet of Things fundamentally insecure, uh, and uh, at some point it's going to come back to bite us. So uh, how does that factor in the calculations of military legislation? Larry, as our, as our chief technologist, <laughs> I certainly find that ironic, given that Dr. Wells is on the line. But uh, but um, uh, but what what I would take a stab at, sir, is is to say that um, it, you know it is it is well known, well acknowledged, I think, at this point, um, that uh, in the United States uh, we rely uh, in you know to, to a significant degree on uh, commercial partners uh, to help us, uh, you know, provide uh, the, the logistics for our, our um, fighting uh, men and women forward. And, um, and, and it, many of those companies uh, are challenged in their ability to, um, to maintain uh, their cyber security. Um, I, I am aware of, of steps that are, are uh, being taken inside the Department of Defense to be able to extend the, uh, uh, the DOD umbrella of security over uh, some of those uh, companies. Um, I don't have a lot of detail on that, and I've probably just said as much as I'm really competent to say on that topic. But 
but I also think that 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 uh, again, I, I don't I don't want to put too much uh, uh, um, I don't want to put too many hopes on one horse. But I, I do think that that artificial intelligence uh, does have uh, the ability to not only make our lives more challenging, uh, but to also make it better. In in that, uh, if if properly, uh, you know. Uh, accessed and, and configured, uh, we can, uh, you know, AI is capable of detecting uh, attacks on uh, itself uh, much faster than, than we are. Uh, and uh, and I, I imagine that, and, and with, with no cybersecurity background whatsoever, I just imagine uh, that in the not too distant future, um, that uh, many uh, many private sector companies and some government agencies will be uh, employing uh, AI as a means to uh, to detect uh, and defend uh, themselves uh, against uh, that attack, acknowledging uh, that the threat surface uh, is about to grow, uh, the attack surface is about to grow considerably. I think one of the things that bothers me about the whole AI business is. Uh, you know, as the algorithms get more and more sophisticated and we kind of get farther and farther away from what they're really doing, at what point, you, how far can you trust them, I guess is the question. And uh, I don't want to- Well, you, you're hitting on something that's that's also something I was just thinking about, and that's the human machine interface. Mm -hmm. And, and where, where do you allow the technology to go to such a level to where, um, potentially it's capable of working without that human interface. You know, I think about fighter aircraft, you know, there, for many years, there's been the thought that you can never get rid of a fighter pilot because no matter what you allow a machine to learn, you still need that human, no kidding, making that end of day decision when you're talking about potentially taking a life. So I think there's a lot of ethical questions and a lot of those human uh, machine interface discussions that we need to have as a community as we go forward particularly to your point, as technology continues to advance at such a rate. Over. But I would add to that, I, I would contend that actually logistics is the absolute perfect yeah. place uh, to go and play with all of this stuff because you don't enter into it and you don't have those ethical issues. Uh, and so I, I would submit that for those uh, inside the Department of Defense looking to, uh, to experiment with AI, that the logistics playground is the perfect place to, uh, to start. Yeah. Hey, um, I noticed we have oh, we have some new um, we have some new people joining us there. Um, just wanted to open up the floor in case there was a question from one of you. Um, so since they probably just come in, uh, just a little bit of background. Of course, we are talking about uh, defense logistics, and uh, which has been an incredibly rich discussion. Uh, we will we will run this again uh, later on to give more people a chance to hear it. But um, are there any particular questions in your mind about how? Uh, you know, how you get the right things, the right place, the right time and environment that's become increasingly contested uh, uh, going forward. We'll go three, two, one. Okay, more torture from George Topic. <laughs> so next up, um, I'm um, interested um, in, um, in this, uh, this sort of goes out to all three of you since you all have significant experience. Um, and that is, I um, interested your thoughts on, on logistics in the context of war games, exercises and experiments. You know, are we doing, you know, are we doing the best we can? What would, are there any suggestions that you would have for us? As you may remember from a couple of years back, um, the Honorable Bob Work and, um, and General Selva when he was the vice chairman said, hey, look, this this is really one of the most important things we are doing, and we absolutely have to do this in order to in order to move forward towards the future. Um, I'm not sure that we I'm not sure that we met fully the um, the diktat that um, that the Honorable Bob and, um, and Paul Selva had for us. Um, and if you had any suggestions, I'd be happy to have them. Over. Hey, hey George, I'll jump on this one first since I kind of just have come out of that environment. Um, what I would say is I think to the point that Larry was making earlier is logistics provides a great opportunity, a great playground to continue to advance our globally uh, integrated operations. Um, I, I got to participate in multiple globally integrated exercises when I was the deputy commander. And what I saw was what, 
what we continue to do. And that's, we kind of fairy dust logistics. We just kind of say, this is just going to kind of happen, but we never go through the A to B to C to D to really talk through not just the challenges that we would have with that, but how they all connect and integrate together, particularly when you're looking at globally integrated operations and you're looking potentially at all combatant commands being involved at the same time and how you prioritize who gets the right thing to which right place at what right time. And as you do that across the globe, you can imagine the complexity in there. However, what I've seen in my view is exercises is we tend to underplay that and we tend to wish it away because that's just too hard. We can't stop the exercise to talk through that because the other things are more important. And we really need, I think, to devote ourselves to talking about some of these tough challenges and what does this look like from a globally integrated uh, perspective going forward. So I, th I think we've got the foundation laid. I think we've got some great opportunity, but this is an area that I think we certainly need to seize uh, going forward, over. I'm not sure I could have said that better. <laughs> well, that's why we're paying them all that extra retired pay. Uh, so, uh, Lynn, your thoughts on this, though, because I mean, you've, you've obviously been watching this for a long, long time at a bunch of different levels. Um, no, I, I, I really agree with, agree with the comments. Um, it just, it, it's one of the questions is, um, I think civil military interactions where I'm at here, and basically one of the things is the pace of progress in the private sector seems to be so fast. And then uh, not having to deal with the you know, DOT, DOT processes, if you will. Uh, uh, how can we take advantage of that more uh, in ways that uh, you maintain the kind of accountability we have and don't leave us two, three, you know, a couple of generations behind where the, where the private tech is going? No, I absolutely understand. So, um, hey, look, we're, we're sort of getting, we're getting towards the end of our time. And I, I, there was one other, one other aspect of this that I think is particular that I, I wanted to make sure we did not um, lose. Um, and that is um, the role of um, supporting allies and partners and working with allies and partners. You know, we use the term interoperability a lot, um, but I think um, we also need to be looking at, when we're looking at an enterprise approach, it's, you know, we have to be looking at what our partners and allies need, as well as what we, um, as what we, we hope we can get from them. So um, with that, I'd like to just throw it open for comments on the joint logistics enterprise, you know, from an ally and partner perspective. Over. So George, I'm going to, I'm going to start off and then I'm sure, I'm sure Vetch will have some, some comments. Um, I'll start off by saying that uh, I am tremendously impressed that the U.S. Marine Corps uh, has uh, got uh, an aviation detachment aboard a Royal Navy uh, vessel at this very moment. Um, and, um, you know, that, that level of uh, cooperation is, is, may appear uh, easy on the surface, but... Um, you know, I, I have it on, on good logistics authority that the logistics nightmare to make that happen, uh, the details that had to be worked out uh, in advance of the deployment have been myriad and, uh, and, and, and have taken a, a quite some time to work out. But that is precisely the kind of operation uh, that we need to undertake uh, more often because it does force us uh, to work out all of those details, kind of what to, to what uh, Lieutenant General Vetri was saying in, in his discussion about wargaming. You, it, the, there's nothing that, that every time you say, and then a miracle happens in logistics, you end up having a problem because uh, every, every the, it, even, even if you end up having, if you have to get fuel from point A to point B, uh, but you end up having, you know, uh, a five inch pipe that has to connect to a two inch pipe and then you don't have the, the, the one adapter to make that happen, the fuel's not gonna get there. And so logistics is all about the detail. 
uh, and about the planning uh, in order to make it happen. So, uh, so anyhow, I, I think I do think that the Marine deployment uh, aboard the uh, the Royal Navy uh, carrier is a tremendous. Uh, uh, um, example of, of what we should be doing uh, more often uh, in the future. Challenging uh, though it is. Yeah, Larry, I, I fully agree with you. In fact, I think that allies and partners are really our key strategic advantage going forward. And I, I think we have to not just um, work with them, we need to count on them. We, they need to be part of our planning efforts in terms of what kind of capabilities what kind of technology? I mean, there there are just so many advancements that are going on that our partners are a significant part of, and I think sometimes we tend to undersell that piece and that importance. And just a, a few examples that come to mind, um, particularly in Africa, is if you look out in in West Africa, the French are largely leading that effort out there, getting at the at the terrorism challenge that we have, uh, but they're doing it with a lot of partnership. I mean, the the European continent has kind of woken up to the problem now and Germany has gotten significantly involved. Um, one of the areas I was working as I was leaving AFRICOM was developing a strategic relationship between us and our UK partners as they look to get more involved on in the continent. Um, and then when you look to the continent itself, again, earlier I mentioned some key partners uh, like Morocco and Tunisia, and there's many others, but across the globe, um, if you look at how many allies and partners we have and the capabilities they have, the, the challenge becomes being able to work through that to your point of the, the complexities that would happen in an operation to be able to make that happen. We've got to work that out now because at the time of a contested war with a near peer partner, we don't have time to figure that out. It's too late. We either know it or we don't. And that's kind of the point I was making on the exercise in war gaming is we've got a tremendous opportunity to do that but we can't do it as ourselves, as the United States. We've got to do it in conjunction with our allies and partners that are like-minded with us and that are trying to bring peace and stability and prosperity throughout the globe, over. In fact, you can, you can, run, that, you can run that even one step further in that, you know, that to the extent that we invest in doing that, we may in fact, in fact, we, we will reduce the probability of kinetic conflict or other um, other thing or or the effects um, you know um, where we are essentially um, forced into positions that we don't want simply because we did not do the preparatory work to um, to bring in our partners and allies you know we're seeing this play out all over the world um, now and it's and it's a really important um, factor in planning for all kinds of things Lynn So oh, how do you see how do you how do you see the uh, kind of the impact of COVID on I unmute my video here for that uh, the impact of COVID on defense logistics not not just on the kind of the bold of things we talked about before but in terms of about people working from home people uh, uh, you know less time in the office uh, how does that impact the way DoD does business one and two other really spectacular new technologies out there like 3D printing or or um, synthetic fuels or something that are really like to be like to be integrated. Larry you want to go first? Well I would say so COVID has provided a tremendous learning opportunity to us first and foremost uh, and, uh, and and a chance to 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 um, uh, show uh, the importance of logistics uh, to uh, all, all of those planners and operators out there who might have had any doubts uh, heretofore. And so, uh, so in that regard, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing, right, uh, that we're having to, uh, you know, suffer so much uh, economic uh, disruption. Uh, so many people uh, have uh, died and so many more have become extremely ill uh, and um, and are, are suffering through uh, you know the effects of recovery that we still are, are coming to terms with. But in in terms of uh, you know what what has COVID really done for us in the logistics community? I think it has shown us the challenges that we need to face up to, and and how we're really going to have to start doing things substantially differently uh, in order to be able to. Uh, uh, 
uh, be effective uh, in, in, in the future, uh, both in, in an uncertain world uh, where uh, human action uh, may create uh, dilemmas for us, uh, but also uh, sort of uh, mother nature is, is also throwing some things at us that we haven't seen before, over. Got it. Dutch, do you want to take a swing and then I will pile yeah. on? So I, I mean, I fundamentally agree with everything Larry said there. I think the key is really adaptability. And, you know, just as you look, as I'm looking across the pictures, you know, we're all in different places in the world, yet here we are joined in cyberspace having a discussion and, you know, up to 240 more uh, will listen into this uh, at some point, hopefully. And it just goes to show the technology, first of all, that exists, but also man's ability to adapt to whatever situation they're given and take the technology and the means that are available and make things happen. You know, the Department of Defense, when COVID kicked off, didn't have a clue how to telework, not a clue. Um, and I was in those beginning days at AFRICOM going, how in the world are we, you mean people don't have to come to work, they can work from home? How do we do that? We don't have the computers, we don't have the technology, we don't have the connections. And guess what? Within weeks, we were up and running and teleworking and barely skipped a beat. In fact, you could argue uh, that we were actually more productive because you didn't have the transit time back and forth in terms of a commute. Uh, so that time was being able to be used productively. So that's just one example. But if you look at logistics writ large, um, I think COVID has provided some, some very unique opportunities. It showed us uh, that technology does exist, that we can leverage it. It shows us perhaps that we've maybe relied on things that have become kind of commonplace and comfortable for too long. And we need to get out of our comfort zone to the point Larry was talking about in terms of stretching ourselves a bit. Um, so I, I think it's been a real wake up call to us. And I, I, I hope uh, that not just our nation, but I hope everyone around the globe is taking stock in that and using this as the tremendous opportunity that can be certainly devastating, certainly a huge tragedy for the globe. When you look at all the deaths and all the, the hurt that's gone along with it. Uh, but there's an opportunity to leverage that and be able to make some real advancements if we take the opportunity to do so. Do you have any sense, uh, uh, any sense of uh, changes in staffing documents and things like that? Or that uh, may be too early to tell, but fewer of X and more of Y in terms of the people side? Did you say would... staffing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it, again, like the electronic age that we live in, we live in the information age. So now instead of taking a package, a physical package, amazing, you can do this stuff electronically. And there's many archaic people like us who weren't willing to go to that because we grew up in that age where we took the package from A to B to C to D to E to be able to coordinate it appropriately to get the final person so they could get signed off on. Well, imagine now you can send it out to all those people at once electronically, get immediate feedback and shrink your time tremendously in terms of being able to get work done. So I think there's, that's just one example, but I think it's shown that sometimes us, us older people, we're the problem because we grew up in a system that we were comfortable with and we don't wanna break glass. Um, but remember, there's a lot of young people down here who didn't grow up in that system and have a lot of uh, initiative and a lot of uh, great ways to do business that we can take advantage of. Hey, Lynn, let me pile on with two additional things. Um, one is that um, one of um, Lieutenant General Vetri's, um, I'll call him friends, um, is um, General Hyten, the vice chairman, um, who I would guess, you know, is not only a really smart guy, but he has learned a whole lot um, from his COVID experience, both about, you know, the interagency, but also about all the processes that are being used. And it has caused him to, to be um, an even greater fan of the logistics community than he was before. And he has become a great advocate for us, and you know, we are going to leverage. Um, we're going to leverage that tremendously. The second point that I um, would make on that, you know, that notwithstanding obviously the tragedy and the cost associated with this within the DoD realm in particular, one of the things that we found is that with the um, so little travel, the availability of our senior leaders and the ability to pull senior leaders together, you know, on a, on a short, on a short basis, a week, a meeting that would have taken weeks, months, many months to put together 
as it turns out, everybody happens to be around. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, there, you know there, and there's an odd irony to that that allows us to do some things more quickly than we otherwise would have. So I, those are two things, those are two points I would make on, on the same, um, on the same vector. So I think that leaves you with the last word, George. We're right at 4.15 and- uh, Okay, so if I can um, torture um, the poor people that have, um, uh, that have tuned in, just to go back and to pay homage to Lieutenant General Chris Christensen um, and the concept of unity of effort without unity of command, you know, which is one of those things that had, um, had Lynn, brought Lynn and me and Chris together many years ago. But you know, thinking back on, you know, on um, Tom Friedman's comments about, um, about how we are this convergence and how, hey, we don't have any choice, we are converging. And that, you know, as a logistics community, we need to be thinking about this and sort of getting out in front of it and understanding uh, understanding what we need to be looking at as we go forward there. You know, I think that, you know, the point that you brought up, Lynn, about COVID is it really has caused us to be able to see some things that are, um, see some things that are out in front of us that we really need to be paying attention to. And especially as we bring it into the education and development enterprise and as Vetch um, pushed on so hard, you know, using young people and, and really in, in incentivizing and taking advantage of young people who are not um, are not saddled with some of the baggage that we have. I wanted to mention um, you know, a couple other points. You know, one is that you know, is looking at agility as, one, as really the cornerstone of what we're going to be able to do because it is really difficult to see out into the future um, with any degree of certainty. Um, and finally, being able to deal comfortably in a world that is uncertain and that and that being being comfortable working in that environment is is something that's just going to be imperative for all of us Lynn with that I think we ought to um, declare victory um, thank our guests um, and thank those of you that dialed in and I hope that this um, tape will have some use for us in the future Lynn over to you Good, well, George we will show this again tomorrow and uh, we will find the future version that has uh, as Chris's uh, interview folded into as well. So it'll be available for circulation. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, catch you later. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, Dutch.